come. Walk down the winding path. Don't mind the spooks and monsters. They stay hidden within the trees. There are mysteries in this world that you need to know, and paranormal truths that need to be told. Come, step up into the caravan, where we share tales of old, as well as new accounts about things you thought only existed in your nightmares. Special shout out to our patrons Jose, Frater Mutata in Lumine, Victoria, Donna, Kadrick, and Rachel. Thank you. We love you. Good evening, traveler. Tonight you're going to get to sit in on a conversation that Lady Anne and I have with author, historian, and researcher Pat Fitzhugh. You're going to get to hear us talk about the Bell Witch and other spooky stories from the South. Hope you enjoy. Speaking yeah. of crazy stuff, what all are we going to do about the Bell Witch? That's about as crazy as crap as I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, well, see, <clears throat> I'm excited to talk about that. I was thrilled when Seth asked me to help out with the Mark of the Bell Witch and dove right into that. And, you know, your book, the the full account, the Bell Witch, the full account, is the one that I tell everybody to grab because it's well, in my favorite. <laughs> well, bless your heart. If I weren't broke, I would be sending you a check. Uh, <laughs> but that's, well, I, I certainly do appreciate that. You know, it's like all, you know, other Bell Witch, other paranormal books, you know, it has its share of fans and it has its share of foes. But, mm -hmm. you know, it has uh, lasted and what I mean by that, average lifetime of books like that is usually a couple of three years. Mm -hmm. That one was originally written 21 years ago. It was released Friday the 13th of October in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And that, that was not by accident either. Uh, sure. I wanted to make it special. And it's been updated uh, several mm -hmm. times since then to maintain the relevancy. But, you know, it has always you know, been out there and been pretty solid. I mean, every year it sells more copies than it did the year before, even now, right. um, which, I mean, that's not saying a lot because those kind of books don't really sell anything anyway, but it's been out there. It's done pretty well. I think it survived some of the ones that came through that were, I guess, what you would call more fantasy based and based and less research based. Right. But yeah, thank you for recommending or mentioning that. That is, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Yeah, I am a huge fan because it's obvious the amount of research that you put into it. And as a researcher, I can appreciate that. And I think that that would also speak to why it is still so relevant. I mean, and like you said, it is solid. Also, the way that you divided it up, it makes it really easy for people to jump to certain areas of interest if they wanted to skip through certain things where when you get to some of the uh i guess quote unquote original texts they can be a little bit dry and a little bit difficult to get through sometimes if you don't know exactly on which page a specific instance is yeah yeah that's just part of research that's that's probably the part of the bell witch legend i like to talk about the most is the research aspect and the history aspect uh, it's been my favorite part of the legend for many different reasons. You know, like you say in the book, I, I go in and I dig in and get a lot of things. Some people don't really understand the why of that or exactly what I'm trying to do. Some people have misunderstood about my research over the years. They've assumed that all of my research is done to prove the existence of the Bell Witch. And nothing could be farther from the truth. The primary goal of my research is not to prove the existence of the Bell Witch or the non-existence, but mm -hmm. to simply get to the bottom of what gave rise to the story. Right. That's what it's about. I've been doing it since, actually, since I was a kid. 
and that was 42 years ago. I've been doing it pretty steady. You know, there are a few years where I dropped off and didn't do a whole lot. Uh, now in the last year or so, several new findings have come up, which I haven't even mentioned yet, that has led my research in another direction. Of course, mm-hmm. it's always always changing directions. That's a hallmark of good research. You have to go where it takes you. Mm-hmm. So the research is now really heavy in certain areas. And then I'm also having to go back to the very beginning of the very first things I researched and the conclusions I drew and reevaluate them. Mm-hmm. And I, I do that from time to time just to make sure everything continues to check out. Because what I learned one year could very well enhance something I learned years ago or help some development that I, I'd learned then. Or what I learned one year could invalidate or nullify what I learned years earlier. So I like to go back and check uh, a whole lot. And right now, what I'm doing, there are a couple of theories, one of which I've been working on for a long time, but they've just about come to fruition. Mm. And what I'm having to do with these new unannounced theories Mm -hmm. is go back and run them against everything that I researched and concluded was historical fact to see whether they hold water. Because I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to announce the theories or even decide how I'm going to announce them Mm -hmm. without checking them out in every way I can. You know, I really, you know, in a way I don't, like the idea of having more than one theory, but in this case, both of the theories are completely mind-boggling and totally brand new. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, they're all checking out so far. So nice. been busy. I've been really busy with that, just trying to dot the I's, cross the T's, and mm-hmm. and the Bellwitch website, which started out back in the early '90s as mm-hmm. part of another website and then was broken off into its own website in the late 1990s, uh, doing a major uh, renovation and revitalization of that website now too, which mm-hmm. has taken me an awful long time. It's over at www.bellwitch.org. Mm-hmm. That's another invaluable resource for anybody wanting to look into the story as well. I've used that often. Oh, well, thank you. I will send you another check in the mail. (laughs) Uh, Your second check's in the mail. (laughs) Wow, and you'll get that, and you'll automatically be a member of the Bell Witch Insiders. There you Uh, go. Even though though that hadn't been announced, but yeah, it's kind of an advanced notice thing for members of the website who want more advanced and deeper notice about things before they're made generally available. Um, That's cool. And it doesn't cost anything. It's just a, you know, I guess whatever you call it, a little three musketeers thing or whatever. Um, But (laughs) uh, the website, there's a lot of information there and a lot that I've researched over the years. And what I'm doing with it right now is, number one, I'm getting rid of anything that has become irrelevant. And there there are some things that have become irrelevant uh, now. I'm uh, mm-hmm. getting rid of those. I'm adding a lot of new things, both in terms of, you know, research findings, as well as even some revisions on some old things that were found back then, where I've managed to find more information. So nice. I've been really busy with that. It's not going to be finished until probably the late spring mm-hmm. of this year. And I decided to do a little bit of uh, rebranding as well. It was mm-hmm. called the Bell Witch website. I mean, mm-hmm. that's as direct as you can get. Duh, it's a website about the Bell Witch. <laughs> but, right. you know, back when I gave it that name was when the World Wide Web part of the Internet was just beginning to come into fruition as most people know it. Mm-hmm. So now when you say the Bell Witch website, and you're looking at it on the internet, that's pretty redundant. So I'm taking out the word web and just calling it the Bellwitch site. And another thing that I'm doing, which is going to change the slogan or whatever you call it, subtitle, is Mm -hmm. I'm adding a whole lot more sections and a whole lot more research 
information, brand new stuff. It's going to cover pretty much everything. So the old subtitle was Keeping the Story Real. The new mm-hmm. subtitle is All Things Bell Witch. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think they kind of right. go in line together. The Bell Witch site, All Things Bell Witch. Mm-hmm. Actually, I should hear back in a couple of days. I've already applied for and bought, you know, the trademark rights to those two names, too. So people just love to copy everything I do when it has to do with the Bell Witch. So I think this time we'll get the one up on them. But yeah, um, (laughs) yeah, I've learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been talking about my own stuff for so long right now. I've about (laughs) killed. (laughs) Yeah, I've, I've about killed what little voice I have left. And oh, I know, man. I know you ladies probably got a lot of questions and discussion mm-hmm. topics, talking points. So yeah. I'll just sit back and you all ask or discuss or cuss or however you want to do this. And <laughs> if I have the answer, I'll let you know. Yeah. Well, I have a lot because I didn't get to go with the guys down to Tennessee to meet you. So. I've been down there, but I didn't get to go with the with the crew down for the filming oh. for that. They did my section up here in Ohio in the oh. same cabin that they did all the recreations. They were the best crew I've ever worked with, even though they're a very small outfit. And I would say uh-huh. pro- probably low budget, mm-hmm. but they, are, they were the best and most professional I've ever worked with. You know, I can be, unfortunately, pretty cynical about the whole TV Bell Witch interview thing because I've done so much of it, not just in the few years since the book, but I was doing it long before the internet. I was I was all over TV with Bell Witch stuff back in the 80s. At any rate, it has generally left a collective bad taste in my mouth. Right. So, right. and I had just heard from two shows within the month before I heard from Seth. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, at the time, I did not know Seth. Mm -hmm. I I don't think I'd ever even heard of him. And the email said he was from a company called Small Town Monsters. Mm -hmm. So my first thought was, oh, my God, I have seen everything. And now I've got some guy (laughs) wanting to turn a bell witch into, into a freaking... Yeah, yeah. So well, some guy trying to turn the Bell Witch legend into a freaking sci-fi monster fest or something. You know, that, that was my first take. But something in the back of my head, maybe it was Kate. I don't know. Yeah. But something yeah. rang in the back mm-hmm. of my head that said, "Be humble." Mm-hmm. I thought, okay, I'm not going to delete this guy's email yet. But I'm mm-hmm. going to do what I'm going to do what I do best. I'm going yeah. to inve- investigate. Yeah. So I, I plugged him mm-hmm. into Google and everything else. You know, who is this Seth guy? I mm-hmm. thought, okay, small town monsters. He's exactly who he says he is. Then I find out he's got several mutual Facebook friends with me. Mm-hmm. And they're good, credible people that I mm-hmm. really like. Mm-hmm. So I'm yeah. thinking, okay, I'll answer him. So I was like, well, tell me what you're doing. Uh, yeah. And then he explained a little bit about on the email, he's wanting to do a historically accurate rendering of the Bell Witch based on the 1817 to 1821 time frame. And the way he talked about it with history, I thought, okay, I'll talk to him about everything. I think this will, this will work out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad, I'm glad I did. Um, Yeah. Because that is the best uh, show that has come out yet on the Bell Witch in in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. I was just going to ask, because, you you know, you mentioned that you've been talking even on TV and stuff since the 80s about this. And you had mentioned earlier about having an interest in this since you were young. So um, I'm not young but, now, but I mean, no, I meant since you were like a kid <laughs> is what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah. The other little boys were trying to get their moms to take them over to their girlfriend's house to go on dates. And I was trying to get my mom to take me to the library and archives. See? So yeah. like so what I was going to ask yeah. is like, was this something that you'd heard about in school? How did you first hear about it that like sparked that interest for you to just, this is part of your path for years and years to come. When I was very young, maybe four or five years old, 
I had this unusual problem with insomnia. Actually, I always do. I was born born for it, I guess. But my mother would tell me little stories at bedtime, little rhymes and stuff like that, and sometimes even try to sing to me, let me fall asleep. But nothing would work. And then one day she happened upon a Bell Witch book. Uh, it was called called The Bell Witch at Adams. It was by a lady named Gladys Barr, who was a school teacher in Middle Tennessee, and it was a Bell Witch children's book, if you can imagine such a thing. She read those stories, and she couldn't get through maybe one chapter or one story before I would just fall off asleep. Mm-hmm. So for some odd reason, stories of the Bell Witch put me to sleep and I would sleep comfortably for the rest of the night. I think that was the first indicator there that I was going to turn out to be a weirdo. You know, later I look back at it and it's because everything, even though I was a little kid, everything she said in that storybook, I kept thinking to myself, this cannot be true. There's no such thing. And Mm -hmm. I would wear my brain out, my little bitty kid brain, trying to figure out how Mm -hmm. could such a thing ever happen or how could somebody pull off such a trick. I I was just born that way, I guess. What do you want to call it? Skeptical or whatever, even at that young age. Mm -hmm. I'd wear my brain out and I'd go to sleep. So she read me that book for a few different nights until she got through all the chapters. And, you know, other than the skepticism, I thought it was a very fun little story, entertaining. I was like, wow, if I go outside right now, will the bell witch get me? You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, If I turn around in the mirror, what's going to happen? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And it was just kind of, you know, I was pretty interested, I guess, in the hocus pocus part of it, the entertaining story. Then a while after that, my mother and I were talking about something, and I think she had ran into some people in Nashville that she went to high school with up there in Robertson County, right near Ground Zero. And she said, do you remember that story I told you about the Bell Witch? And I said, oh, yeah, 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 the Bell Witch chased me the other day. And uh, she kind of laughed and said, well, this lady I just told you about that I went to school with, she's a descendant of such and such character in the Bell Witch legend. And I was just shocked. I said, what do you, a descendant, what what do you mean? And she said, oh, the Bells were real people. And the people's names who are mentioned in the book about the Bell Witch were real people. And at that point, I got really scared. So I'm like, mommy, is it real? She said, well, the people sure were. So I started thinking about it more from a whodunit standpoint than a ghost standpoint. But it Mm -hmm. was just amazing the fact, number one, that it involved real people and places. And number Mm -hmm. two, through a marriage several generations back, on my mother's side of the family, there is a distant relationship with the Bells. Even though it's wow. not a it's not a direct descendancy, uh, mm-hmm. it's just very distant uh, type thing. So right. when I got a little bit older and I'd had a few years to think about it, I wanted to start looking at you know other books and things that had been written about it. Going to the archives room at the Nashville newspaper, trying to find old newspaper articles about it. Uh, going mm-hmm. up to the Robertson County archives, which that was really easy because my mother happened to be good friends with a woman who who ran it. Uh, so I was able, you know, to go there pretty much any time. You know, that's kind of how I got interested in it and started the research. So you remember like the first article that you saw when you were going through these old newspapers that. It was just so exciting to see it in in print in a newspaper rather than in a a children's book. book. Yeah. Right. I didn't know it at the time, but what I was really happy about was to know that it wasn't just some fiction book that some lady wrote, that there's Mm -hmm. more to it than just that book. Mm -hmm. Of course, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that back then, but, you know, now that I look back, that's what it was about. Yeah. And I can't even remember which article. I probably didn't find all of them because the guy wasn't, the library wasn't that helpful, but Mm -hmm. there were quite a few articles written in the Nashville, Memphis, and Louisville newspapers in the years just before the Ingram book came out. And then another bunch of them were written about the 1904, 1905 timeframe when somebody claimed the Bell Witch was supposed to return, even -hmm. though that's not the date that was promised. Then right. le- later, about the 1920s, 1930s, there were a lot of articles. Well, a lot. I'll say maybe five or six over that period written about the Bell Witch, 
you know, like junior, junior Jim Bob James that lives at such and such farm <laughs> reported something, a noise at his barn the other night and neighbors have concluded that it might be something to do with the famous bell witch. And then, and then, yeah. And then the article goes on and on and on uh, telling the legend of the uh, bell witch. And then there was a, an article, which I didn't stumble upon until later is by accident. It was called the critter of cars Creek. Ooh. Cars Creek is a creek that runs through Springfield, Tennessee, in the countryside, about six or seven miles from the Bellwitch area. And people, uh, even sheriff's deputies and everybody had seen this strange, hairy creature around Ooh. Cars Creek late at night for several nights in a row. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the newspaper, being who they were, had to bring the Bellwitch into it and, <laughs> you know, try to create some kind of Bellwitch tie. And, yeah, that was crazy. But the, but the oddest thing about that, they found out that this creature was a was an actual it was a farmer's goat and oh. there was something about its genes or chemical composition that made it essentially look like a goat but with the hair of a bigfoot oh man hmm. the, it's well what was so interesting in that article is it said the sheriff's department picked it up or caught it, you know, just like yeah. a original criminal, I guess. And I'm thinking, why did the wildlife officers not come? Fast forward about 15 years, and I'm giving a le Bell Witch lecture to the Robertson County Historical Society. That covers Springfield, Adams, and a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And there's about, I guess, 150 people in the room. And near the end of it, somebody asked a question, well, did you ever hear of the critter that they used to talk about? And I immediately said, oh, yeah, the Cars Creek Critter. And this was this real old man. Mm -hmm. He stood up and said, I was on that case. I was a sheriff's deputy way long time ago. And they called me to come get that thing. <laughs> Just like it said in the, in the paper. I said, well, sir, I've always wondered. They said the sheriff deputies came and got it. What did they do with it? He said, I didn't have anywhere to put that damn thing, but we had some empty cells at the jail, so I took him up the jail and just kept him in a jail cell until the game warden could come get him. And then he laughed. He said, that is the only wild animal that has ever been placed under arrest in Robertson County. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, you, I love it. Yeah. We're way off topic, but I think we're having such a good conversation and everything's flo oh, I adore it. <laughs> Everything's flowing so well. Um, okay, I think it, the question was how I got interested in the Bell Witch. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah what, totally. what else is up? I, I'm in love with your song. You're Heather, in love with my song? Nice, your okay. song, yes. Because there's a certain type of music that I really love. And... And I, I mean, I can't really say what the category is, just that some of these songs have this ghostly, otherworldly feel, like you feel something within it as you're listening to it. And I definitely felt that with your Bell Witch song. I just, I, I loved it. And I cannot wait to play it at the end of this for everybody to hear it. Oh, well, thank you. Now you're going to get a check too, if I ever win the lottery. <laughs> Yeah. Well, tell, tell everybody about the song. Like, when did you first think that you were going to write a song about it? And how, how long before it came into being? And Well, with the Bell Witch, Let the Game Begin, that was suggested to me after a book signing and lecture event a couple of years ago. Uh, the co-writer on the lyrics, Mike Richards, came to my signing and lecture event. I had met him through his family who used to go to a lot of paranormal investigation and research type events. And they had told me about Mike, that he was a musician and that he loved Tennessee and Appalachian folklore and especially the Bell Witch. So it's like, you know, to heck with this ghost hunt. I want to go meet Mike. But <laughs> at any rate, um, Mike finally came to one of my events we met for the first time. And we were talking afterward, you know, strictly about the legend. And he says, so, Pat, when did you write your Bell Witch song? I said, oh, I've never written one about the Bell Witch. And he's like, well, why don't you? And I'm 
Michael, I never thought about doing it. He said, yeah, it could be really big. It, it would work out well. Uh, you know, I'm sure you could play something. You could come up with something good. And if you did it, yeah, it would come out really well. You ought to do it. And I just said, okay, I tell you what, let's make that happen right now. So um, a little later, we started working together on it. He wrote the chorus of the song. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote everything else, including the music. I had had yeah. a little lick that I had toyed around with for several years, just goofed off with, you know, make see if I'm in tune. I'm not sure how deep you all are into music, but it had a flatted seven note and a major chord lick, which gave it a little bit of a, what you call a sneaky, rustic, swampy sound. Thought, mm -hmm. okay, I'll do that. I'll put it in D minor. I know what mode I'm going to use with these chords to give it a real airy, air of night, spooky type effect. And uh, mm -hmm. I just went from there, my intro versus chorus, uh, instrumental and lute and all that. So that's how I got the music done. Mike suggested that I become the storyteller in the song. Initially, I was supposed to be the vocalist, and I told him up front, I cannot even sing in the shower much less on a song that we're going to release oh. to radio. So he's like, well, just record it and sing a little bit of it and send it to me. So I did. He's like, you are definitely going to be the storyteller. I'll find somebody else to sing the chorus, <laughs> which is exactly. Oh. So mm -hmm. Mike wrote the chorus and we just put it together. Uh, most all of it was recorded here in my home studio, the music part. Uh, the vocals were recorded at a professional record labels uh, studio there in Nashville, and then I did most mm -hmm. of the engineering and mastering here. So it's pretty much a complete self-made uh, song and production. Wow. It took back seat on my list of to-dos for a long time, but then uh, I got to thinking in early 2020 that it was going to be the 200th anniversary of John Bell's death. And the other four huge things that I had going on Bell Witch wise for 2020 were all canceled due to COVID. I said, I think it's time we take this song and run with it, finish up the tracks, record it and release it around Halloween time on the year of the 200th anniversary. So that's what we did. Perfect. And it's been received really well. It has been overseas. It is currently uh, number three on the Blues and Roots radio charts, international charts. I think it started out at number seven a couple of months ago, and it has not left the charts. It's just been a different numbers, you know, fluctuation there. As far right. as the United States, it has not, especially around Middle Tennessee and Bellwitch territory, it has not received the amount of reception that we had expected that it would. Mm -hmm. But the international people, uh, your overseas people and the people in Canada especially are keeping that song afloat. That's awesome. Yeah, so when you talk about like international audiences, of course, aside from just the type of music, clearly there's something about the content that they're enjoying. Have you had feedback from international people before on your work or just the Bell Witch in general? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There is a, quite a bit of interest in the Bell Witch overseas, especially in Europe. Actually, even in Japan, back, I think it's about 15 years ago, they had a magazine over there. They used to have it in the United States. It's called Esquire Magazine. It's like a men's fashion magazine or something. Oh, it, it. it was real big in the United States years ago. Mm -hmm. They have yeah. a Japanese version, and they had me uh, submit a picture and write an article for them over there that was japan and mm -hmm. i actually got to see they sent me a, a copy of the magazine and got to see my story that i wrote for it written in japanese i thought that was kind of cool oh, wow. but japan uh australia some and england yeah especially there's a lot of interest uh in those areas and i think that helped with the song people see a song or see anything and they see those two words bell witch and if they've ever even heard of the story, their heart does a little pitter-patter. <laughs> even if they don't like the story, they've got to see what the heck somebody's saying or singing about the Bell Witch. So I think the interest over there had a lot to do with the song doing so well internationally. 
and uh, international, of course, as in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. I have some friends up there. That's going to be Steve and Alex. They have their own radio show. It is called uh, Nocturnal Frequency, Mm. and uh, it's a paranormal Mm. show. I've been on there a lot. We talked about the Bell Witch, a lot of other paranormal cases and everything. And, you know, that show has a huge listenership. And they have gotten the word out about the Bell Witch there for years and years now. And so there's a lot of interest there as well. Awesome. Those sound like good friends, for sure. Oh, yeah. They're they're great guys. Of course, them being where they are, me being where I am, I did, I've never been able to meet them until a couple of years ago. Steve was traveling to Florida with his father-in-law, and they came through Nashville. And we actually sat down at a restaurant and just devoured a bunch of margaritas and ate a bunch of nachos and (laughs) talked paranormal and had a ball one night after all these years. That is really awesome. I have to say it was incredible to be able to go over there and meet Heather uh, when it was my birthday in November. And I cannot wait to come back and we'll definitely have to go to the Bell Witch Caves. Yeah, if you all ever come to Nashville, just let me know. Give me some notice. I can get, if you have, have either of you all ever been here, like to Adams, Tennessee, at any point in the past? Yeah, I, well, she hasn't, but I've been there a couple times. Okay, so you can be the tour guide. Uh, Just let me know. I'll meet you all, and (laughs) we will, we will go around Adams, including a whole lot of places that you would not know where are otherwise and would never see otherwise or even hear about otherwise. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it is an interesting place for sure. And where in Ohio are you, Heather? So I grew up in a small town called Carrollton, but I live closer to Canton now where the football hall of fame is. I'm in a, a really, I grew up in an, an interesting location where within about 90 minutes, I could either be in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Lake Erie. Uh, <laughs> cool. Yeah. So I'm right at the foothills of the Appalachians. Um, but Oh, yeah. okay. So you were Southeast maybe. Uh, well, yeah. No. Yeah. I'm about east. halfway down the state, but I'm on the East side. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's about, about an eight hour drive. I think for me to get to Adams, yeah. the times that I've went, cause I have to yeah. go clear across Ohio. Yeah, Ohio is pretty fun. I had to drive across Ohio starting the southern part. There was about three inches of snow on the highway. And by the time Mm -hmm. I got up, this was on the book tour for the release of the full account book. By the time I got up to do my uh, signing and lecture up in Cleveland, I got out of my car and I noticed there was like three or four feet of snow on the ground everywhere. (laughs) You know, it took me like 10 minutes to get from my car into the bookstore. Uh, And with all these people, all these huffy people, because the author wasn't there on time. And, you know, I wanted to say, good God, I just drove all the way from Nashville through ice and snow. And I'm only 10 minutes late. I think I did pretty darn good. But yeah, I'd uh, say so. It was up, I can't even think of the place. It was called Shaker Square Bookstore or something like that. But, Hmm. uh, did that up there, and their newspaper actually gave a great review for the lecture and for the book and all that. But yeah. I think they call that Lake Effect Snow or something, maybe. Yep, off of Lake Erie. Yeah, and then I ran into that. I was up there a couple of years ago, two different times for a total of several weeks for work. I actually got called out at the last minute, and I was in a little town called Conneaut, Ohio. Mm, I don't know that one. It's right on Lake Erie. You drive just a tad bit to the east. You're in Erie, Pennsylvania. You drive oh, about okay. a few more miles and you're in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I flew in up there in that afternoon and this was in January of all times. It was like 51 <laughs> degrees in Cleveland when I flew into Cleveland. And then by the time we, we got the rental car and drove two and a half hours over to Conneaut, Ohio, it was down to like 35. <laughs> then that night, go to a restaurant and eat. I went in, mm-hmm. it was 35 and clear. Yeah. When I left the restaurant, mm-hmm. it was 35 and eight inches of snow. Yep. <laughs> I was hoping for snow so bad when I was she there. Missed it. Course, yeah, yeah, it was the day after she left. It snowed several inches. That's uh, <laughs> the way it works. Right after but, you left. Yeah. yeah. We took her for a ghost hunt. And of course, 
there was no heat in the building. So she did get to experience pretty cold temperatures for well, hours. There, well, there you go. There you go. If you, yeah. if you like that sort of thing, my life's mission is to move to South Florida for the opposite reason. But, um, <laughs> and your ghost hunt was where? I think she told me and I forgot. Was it the reformatory? Well, the reformatory is where we filmed the third um, episode for On the Trail of Hauntings for Small Town Monsters. But when Anne was here, I took her to Fairfield County Infirmary in Lancaster, Ohio, which is oh, yeah. a little bit south of Columbus. I've heard of that one. I yeah. did the reformatory one several years ago. Creepy enough place, but I didn't see or notice any activity that I would couldn't attribute to something non-ghostly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then I was a kid. My aunt and uncle lived up there at Mansfield. And I used to go up there quite a bit to see them, but I yeah. didn't know about the other places. Yeah. So the Mansfield song, is a beautiful building. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a, what do you call it, an architectural work of art. It is. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, the song the song has done really well. I'm really proud of how it has done on the international level. I'm going to keep it out there. I'm going to keep pushing it really hard, especially around Halloween each year, and uh, just hope that people enjoy it. I'm excited to share it with our listeners, too, after the episode. Yeah, me, too. Awesome. More checks. <laughs> I wanted to ask you as a researcher for anyone who's starting into any type of research, what would be your advice for like the first place that someone should go when they're looking into something? Would it be the library, newspaper archives, um, relatives, locals? What like what is your typical process that you would pass on to someone else? There are two schools of thought on that. One is go right to the location that you're researching or where the event you're researching allegedly happened and just feel it and experience it for yourself first mm -hmm. and then start going to places like libraries and other places to look up information. That way, when you first visit the place, your mind does not carry any type of bias and it's not contaminated by things you have read about the place, which may not even be true. The other school of thought is get as much information as you can before you visit a place or before you dig too deep in the research by using a deductive approach with a bell witch mainly I think because I was a kid and didn't know any better. The first place I went was to libraries looking for other books about the case, newspaper articles, you know, just to give me a really good working foundation from which to work and expand my research deeper and into more areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now things with uh, the internet, there's so much you have to watch for because like you said, people can just take your take your work and put it out there if you don't have a way to stop them. It happens all the time. And thanks to the <laughs> Digital Millennium Copyright <laughs> Act, there's pretty much not a darn thing anybody can do about it if their work's taken anymore. Essentially, they send a takedown notice to the person or entity. They file a response saying that they're using it under fair use. And mm -hmm. according to the law, once yeah. they do that, they file a response. If they don't take it down, you have seven days to come up with thousands and thousands of dollars and hire a lawyer and file a suit. Oh. Well, I mean, yeah. I don't I don't have money in my pocket just to be pitching around to lawyers suing right. just because mm -hmm. somebody stole the work. But with regards to Internet, mm -hmm. you know, two words when it has to do with research, those words are, oh, God. I read it the other day on the internet where Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you hear on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. The internet is for the people. It's by the people. It's a very wonderful thing that has revolutionized the way people research, the way people relate to each other, the way people fight and argue with each other, and the way people <laughs> conduct business. It's a yeah. great thing. But yeah. remember, it's by the people. By mm -hmm. the people means mostly unvetted. Right. Things right. are posted right. as facts where the person may be well-intentioned but did not do proper research. Right. And then right. 
everybody else will believe it just because so-and-so said it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be really careful when researching things through the internet. What I usually do with that, I will look for things like things through the Library of Congress or the Chronicling of America website, uh, some mm -hmm. of the state government historical board websites, places like that where I know for a fact that the data have been vetted. Mm -hmm. Whereas right. a lot of places, what you find out turns out to be more like a a biased, slanted perspective on certain things or even opinion rather than fact. Right. Um, and I've seen that a lot on Wikipedia. Yeah, years ago, I happened to be an editor there. I'm not anymore. And actually, I never did contribute to their Bellwitch article, though. But on their Bellwitch article there for a while... Some people took that over and were basically using that as a way to analyze and research and, of course, argue about the Bell Witch case. Mm. When uh, Wikipedia is a reference material. Right. And the article is supposed to present the legend and all the different things that have been said and written about it not for a bunch of people to get in there and say, this is the only right version or I am right and you're wrong and all this other BS, but it took a while for all that to get fixed. And actually a good friend of mine is the main editor of the Wikipedia article on the Bell Witch. And so he put a stop to that. But the internet, it's just one of those things. You've got to be really careful where you research it. Yeah, absolutely. I was always curious what your favorite part was from the Bell Witch legend. Is there a particular story that you, has always been one of your favorite parts to go over? My favorite part of the Bell Witch legend, uh, when I'm in storytelling mode, not research mode, but as a right. storyteller and an entertainer, my favorite part to tell is that of what they call the witch family. It's a cool story. I think it goes a little more in depth than a lot of these other little stories that comprise the legend in that it actually has these names, Black Dog, Mathematics, Jerusalem, and Cypography. You know, mm -hmm. these characters, and if you look long and hard, you can actually find definitions for each of those words and what element of reality and the human psyche that they actually represent. Right. So it, it's very interesting in that regard and that apparitions allegedly showed up that matched the characters by age and gender. Black Dog was supposedly a grown woman. Mathematics and Cypography were little girls and Jerusalem was a little boy. Mm -hmm. But yet in these characters that Esther Bell Porter and her sister Betsy saw across the road from Esther and Bennett's house mm -hmm. matched the ages and genders or the approximate ages right. there. And then, as you know, in the story, in at least one account that night, the disembodied voice speaks up and says, wow, that Alex Porter sure is a good shot. He got Jerusalem's arm from 75 yards out. And that was the point where he fired the gun at the log because he did not see any apparitions, but Betsy and her sister did. He fired at the log where they told him to, and they told him that a little boy just ducked under the log. So, right. you know, I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, mm -hmm. whether that little story is true, I don't know. Right. You know, as a, re a balanced researcher, I'm not out looking for this thing to be paranormal, but I'm not mm -hmm. out looking for it to necessarily to be human either. You know, right. I have to give it 50-50 weight right on the fence, mm -hmm. and that's to eliminate bias. So mm -hmm. as a researcher, I look at that little story that I just told as being who was present when that mm -hmm. occurred, who was also present at the Bell home that night, and did they know ventriloquism? Right. So, th so they could relate the story. It would have to be right. somebody who saw those characters behind the log, and that was mm -hmm. only two people. Mm -hmm. But then yeah. again, the account that mentions that story, the first account that mentions that story itself is based on hearsay, testimony, right. and secondhand testimony. So, how do we even know that's true? You know, that's just how my mind works. 
but it's still a fun story to, story to tell. And when I do the lectures, I make it a point to let people know when I'm in research mode, I'm one way. But when I'm just telling the story and entertaining, my objective is to scare the bejeepers out of you. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love it. and that's, that's okay. I mean, some people used to kind of like throw me under the bus for that, but you know, Hey, at least I'm being transparent. I think that's more than right. some people have done. I'm, yeah. I'm up here saying I'm, my name is Pat Fitzhugh. I'm fixing to tell you what is probably a lie, but I'm going to make you enjoy it. And then afterwards mm -hmm. I'll tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite Bell Witch story. The most popular Bell Witch story has always been that of the Andrew Jackson encounter, mm -hmm. where future president Andrew Jackson and his men go up there, the wagon gets stopped and all that, and then a guy gets in trouble that night, and then they, the entity tells Jackson that there's another fraud in his party, and Jackson says, sure, go ahead and tell me. If there's an idiot in my party, I want to know who it is. And then all of a sudden, they left. You know, everybody loves to hear that story. It's the most requested story of all. I get so tired of constantly <laughs> telling it, you know, just, you yeah. know, I'll, I'll do it till the day I die if people want to hear it, but it's just not my favorite story to tell. You know, looking back at Jackson, and I think the Bell Witch, Mark of the Bell Witch actually covered that, was we know for historical fact that two, possibly three of John Bell's sons had fought under Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans and the mm -hmm. Battle of uh, Horseshoe Bend, both of mm -hmm. which arose from the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. We also know for historical fact that Jackson owned property about two, two and a half miles away from the old Bell Farm. It was uh, just a tract of land. He didn't live there, but I think he used that to raise his racing horses or or groom his racing horses or something. We know that. So what that tells me is he certainly would have had a reason to stop in at the Bell home at some point. I don't know how often he came to the area, but he could have stopped. Right. But that's a whole different ball game than whether he encountered the Bell Witch. Right. You know, I've been able to find, as have some other researchers, that during the whole time of the haunting, Jackson was mostly in Texas, Texas and Louisiana area. Mm -hmm. And when he was back here at his home in Nashville, the Hermitage, which is only about a mile and a half up the street from where I live right now, he was sick. Mm -hmm. And then there was a time he was also up in Kentucky for a little while. So we have no proof that he ever encountered the Bell Witch. And chances are he probably didn't have time to visit John Bell during those four years either. My initial thought on this was, you know, a man aspiring to become the president of the United States 125 years after the Salem witch trials is not going to go around on the campaign trail telling everybody that he talked to a paranormal entity. So <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe he did have some kind of encounter there, but just didn't tell about it. But then another researcher brought up the fact that that particular election was one of the most bitter and nasty elections in American history, as far as mudslinging was concerned. And if there had been any idea of Jackson having this Bell Witch encounter, his opponents and haters would have used that to dog him. But at any rate, I don't feel that he encountered the Bell Witch. Yeah, you mentioned the the different uh, ways to look at the story, and it reminded me of the different versions even of the story. I mean, of course, people in, in Tennessee have grown up hearing slightly different versions, but there's completely other versions when you get to like Mississippi, right? And even isn't there a different one in North Carolina that kind of looks vastly different than yes. what we know? Yeah, that's correct. There are three different versions of the Bell Witch, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, the North Carolina version centers on the Bell family and crop failures and a very hated, disliked slave overseer that worked for John Bell, who mm -hmm. reportedly did not even get along with the Bell family that well, except for uh, the mother, Lucy Bell. Mm -hmm. And the story has it that he was walking with some other men out in one of the fields one day, 
and talking very, uh, what's the word, inappropriately about Bell's daughter, Mary Bell, who, mm -hmm. according to that story, was born in North Carolina and then had already left home before the Bells ever moved to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And when Mr. Bell heard this slave overseer talking about what a fine looking little kid or juvenile, whatever I said, right. she was very young, mm -hmm. that Mr. Bell confronted him in one of the barns and actually killed him. That is uh -huh. the North Carolina version. Now, right. there's not much more evidence to prove that than there is the Tennessee version. Yeah. In that, yes, the people and places did exist. Even the slave mm -hmm. overseer did exist. There is no record at all of John Bell ever killing a man in North mm -hmm. Carolina. That doesn't yeah. mean he, did, he didn't do it, but I'm just saying historically, we can't prove that he killed the slave overseer. Even if we could, we can't prove it's over what the slave overseer said about his daughter. He could have killed him for other reasons. So like the Tennessee legend, there's a lot of guesswork involved. The, so, that one always threw me off because of the mention of, an, of another daughter that was yeah. gone before Tennessee, because nobody ever talks about that daughter aside right. from that version. Right. And I had trouble even when I actually went there and went through records in two different cities out there in the yeah. same area where they were tying a Mary mm -hmm. to the bells. Yeah. However, what I did find was a person and this was, this was a Mary who had the middle name of bell and then another last name who had died I think it was probably early to mid 1800s, like in, like in the 1840s. And she grew up in the same place, exact same place, Kennecke Swamp, that John and Lucy Bell lived in before they moved to Tennessee. And her date of birth was like in the 17, 17, late uh, 1770s, early 1780s, which mm. would have put her right at about 20, 20, uh, 24, 25 when the Bells moved to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And back in those mm -hmm. days, she was that age, she was already married, long gone, and had her own family. But back right. then, they, they married really early and had big families. Yeah. So what I found puts the name, it could be Mary Bell, and then used Bell as a middle name, and then the man right. she married was a last name, exact same area at Kennecke Swamp and was e even a member of the Kennecke Baptist Church that John Bell and them were members of Interesting. over there. In fact, when they moved, they moved to Tennessee because they were following the pastor of that church when he moved to Tennessee and started Red River Church. And then his son was the Bell's pastor. I don't know, I could go on forever on that, but at any mm -hmm. rate, I can attest to a Mary Bell who married okay. some guy Okay. who was born right at about the time, like five or so years after John and Lucy Bell married mm -hmm. and was even a member of the same church. But I cannot prove that she was the biological daughter of John and Lucy Bell. Right. Yeah, that was something that I had really gotten hung up on because I'd heard that name. And then in the books, um, and I think I'd even gone on Ancestry and just couldn't find her anywhere and so that had really thrown me for a loop but i no, I'm it's glad not to on, know that you found her i couldn't find it on the internet uh yeah. this i think was basically i was looking through indexes for different records and saw the name and then what i had traced it down to was a through a probate record oh, okay. where like uh, yeah. i think it was actually her husband's will that was probated okay and then I just kind of took that and ran with it and found some other things. It's a big paper chase. Oh, sure. But that's the North Carolina version. Then the Tennessee version, we all know that. Mm -hmm. So then the Mississippi version, there is some question as to when it started. One school of thought, and some people, even some books say that it started right after the Bell children that moved to Mississippi had gotten settled in there which mm -hmm. they moved, Esther 
quarter. They moved, I think it was 1836. And then about the 1838, 39 time frame, Jesse Bell and his family moved there. Then a little later, Betsy Bell's daughter, several of her daughter, two of them at least, moved down there. Uh, and one of them actually married Esther and Alex Porter's son, thereby making them first cousin or kissing cousins, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of that that went on in the Bell family back then. Right. And a lot, a lot of others too. So the Mississippi legend, according to some accounts, started after they arrived and things started happening. Other accounts say the Mississippi legend did not happen or start getting talked about at least until after the Ingram book was published. You know, my take on it is the Ingram book got published and people in that area learned about it, uh, learned about the legend and knew either firsthand or through maybe some older relatives that some of the Bell children moved down there to that area. And I think the fact that they were now in the Mississippi area and the people had gotten a hold of what happened uh, according to the Tennessee legend, they mixed the two together, probably not intentionally, but that was the end result. They put it in the kettle, they stirred it up, and their potion became the Mississippi legend, which is nowhere nearly as large as the Tennessee legend in terms of events. But the events that it does mention, most of those events are the exact same events that took place in the Tennessee legend, only the names of the locations like creeks and roads were changed to those in Mississippi. And in some cases, the name of the Bell family member who had that encounter was changed to a Bell family member's name in Mississippi. So I think it, the Mississippi version is really a mesh between the Tennessee. Well, it is. It's a mesh between the Tennessee legend and the fact that some of the people moved to Mississippi. What grew grew out of that was a story that really trimmed down the Mississippi version, and it was that a man by the name of John Thomas Bell, who was the son of Jesse Bell and the grandson of John Bell, he and his family lived down there right near uh, in the Eureka community just outside of Batesville. Nice mm -hmm. little place. I've been there all the time. He moved there with his family. He had an evil slave overseer and, or this slave overseer was after his daughter trying to, you know, start a courtship or something. And the mm -hmm. daughter really wasn't interested. And right. for some reason, I think he, John Thomas Bell found the slave overseer alone somewhere, like in a barn, sound mm -hmm. familiar, uh, yeah, found him in right. the barn and killed him <laughs> right. just like in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. But this was John Thomas Bell, his grandson. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was making eyes at his young daughter. Then after this guy died, this guy, his name was supposedly Gerald. The mm -hmm. Bell Witch of Mississippi was a man, and his name was Gerald, the slave overseer. He died. Then shortly thereafter, Mr. Bell's daughter got very, very sick and was bedridden, had fever, all kinds of problems. And mm -hmm. as she lay there dying, she got really calm and peaceful. Her eyes opened up real bright and said, I'm going to be leaving you now so I can go be with Gerald because I love him. And then she died. And wow. then they were carrying her down the road to Long Branch, or excuse me, Long Creek Cemetery off of Eureka Road. And the whole time she was being carried on the horse drawn hearse, there was this supposedly strange looking bird flying up over the hearse as it went down the road. Uh, and it had a bell on its neck and it was ringing a bell sound and crying. Wow. And then the girl was buried and nothing else happened. Uh, that's essentially the Mississippi version. I've interviewed and talked to a whole lot of people there. Some are non-believers. Some are very strong believers. Others are just uh, indifferent. I've heard a lot of wild stories there. I had a lady and her daughter, both of whom were, the lady was actually pretty old and the daughter was middle-aged, swear up and down to me that 
their farmhouse is on property that was once owned by Jesse Bell. And one day they got up in the morning and started running water and there was blood coming out of the uh, water, water spouts. Crazy, crazy stuff. The bigger thing about Mississippi is the side story or the meta story, the story of the story. Betsy moved there later in life because her health had started failing her. And then she died in 1888, is buried down at Long Branch, which is near Water Valley. And a guy I know who for years was president of the Historical Society there, and he was a real, real old timer. And I think his father like lived to be 100 also. Um, But his father had actually met Betsy. He knew that family, uh, Betsy Powell. There were a lot of stories passed down by the old timers about Betsy Bell. And the stories weren't really suspect or anything. One of the stories said that she always refused to sleep alone. She had to have somebody sleep with her every night she went to bed and that she would always sleep on the side of the bed closest to the wall and preferably up against the wall and facing the wall, you know, lying on her side and facing the wall. Mm -hmm. And people thought that was peculiar. Then when the Ingram book came out, uh, a lot of the Bell descendants down there were very angry because they said it wasn't true, Mm -hmm. or that that wasn't the real deal as far as what really happened in Tennessee with the Bells. Then you had the Charles Bailey Bell book come out uh, originally in 1934, and Bell descendants then, including some of Betsy's own descendants, actually went all over northern Mississippi to every bookstore, everywhere that they could find copies of the Charles Bailey Bell book. They would buy them up and take them home and store them in their attic. And Mike, the guy I know, he he told me eventually, he thinks some of them just burned the books, but they were initially stored in their attic because their take on it was, and Mike actually knew some of those people because he was real old. Those people were of the opinion Charles Bailey Bell essentially took Ingram's book, which they say was not true, and then put his own spin on that and added a bunch of things in for excitement just to try to capitalize off the bell, which is promised return in 1935, one year after the book. And he was trying to capitalize on that. And most everything he said was a lie. That's what they say. Mm. That's what the Mississippi descendants said. I, it and breaks I, my heart to even think about grabbing up a bunch of books and burning them. He said they kept them in their attic, but he, he thought that some of the relatives burned them, but I don't think all of them did. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think he said at one point he ran into a whole trunk of <sighs> those books. What a fine that would be. Yeah, it would be. But, you know, the interesting thing about that book, which I know I've talked about on my website, I think I put it in my my old book. If I ever do a new one, I'll stick it in there. But much of the Bell Witch's alleged predictions that Charles Bailey Bell said that it told to John Jr. are based upon the death date of John Jr., which was May 8th, 1862. At least that is what Charles Bailey Bell thought. Tim Henson and I found where his estate sale, as well as a bill of sale for the clothes that John Jr. was going to be buried in, both state his date of death as April 8th, 1862. And if you and if you compare those predictions, especially when he predicts that the uh, city of New Orleans will be taken over by the Northern Army uh, right there at his death or something. If you put this new correct date in there, it invalidates that and several other predictions that Charles Bailey Bell said were true. Oh, wow. And they were all based on Charles Bailey Bell's incorrect mm-hmm. assumption of his grandfather's death date. Wow. So. Wow. You know, so I cannot say that I disagree with those Bell descendants that say the book was a pack of lies. But on the other right. hand, you know, who am I? I mean, I can't I can't prove it one way or another. I'm, I'm old, but I'm not old enough to have been there and seen it. So I don't know. So, Yeah, that made me wonder, since you since you have started uh, researching, have you noticed a fluctuation in the reception of the Bell Witch story at all? People willing to talk about it with you? <laughs> um, willingness to talk as in among the descendants, 
Um, it doesn't even have to be necessarily the descendants. I've heard that people in the area sometimes, uh, I suppose it depends on who you talk to, but uh, sometimes people in the immediate vicinity aren't super open to talking about it while others are. And I didn't know right. if that was something that fluctuated over the years. In general, a lot more people know of the legend now than did 10 years ago. And then a lot more than there, there were 20 years ago. The legend is a lot, it's much wider, wider known now. As far as interest is and questions are concerned, not nearly as many questions have been asked in the last 10 or 15 years as were asked before that. I mean, before that, there were constant emails and chat requests and everything else with all kinds of questions about the legend. Whereas the interest may be wider now, I don't think the interest is collectively, collective interest is deeper. You know, a lot more people know about it now, but it's like, oh yeah, the bell wish, boo hoo, I'm going to scare you. Ah! And you know, that that's as far as they go with it. <laughs> right. Whereas, you know, 15, 20 years ago and earlier, people would hear about it. They were intrigued by it and they would ask a million questions, uh, go on vacation up to Adams, Tennessee, visit everything they could, uh, you know, just all kinds of stuff, you know, and I think there, that we still have the same depth of interest among people, but because the breadth of it or the width of awareness of the legend has gotten so become so wide, that depth of curiosity mm -hmm. automatically equates to a lower percentage. Right. But, you know, it's still there. It's, you know, people watch it. I was doing a page the other night, a website upgrade, a page, and I'd, I'd updated a couple of things. And all of a sudden, I got an email from a guy who was asking questions like he'd been researching it for 100,000 years. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, we get those from time to time. Yeah. Actually, actually, the guy turned out to be a, an actual local hero around here. He oh. solved, he oh. solved a murder case 30 years later or 30 something years later oh. where a little girl, nine years old, who actually lived less than a quarter of a mile from me in my neighborhood oh. was abducted and then was totally gone and missing for a while and then found murdered. It was mm. a cold case that was never solved. It was on the national news. There were books written about it, all kinds of stuff. And then this guy, who was a captain with the Nashville Police Department, he opened, reopened the cold case and said, you know, hey, right now we have something called DNA that we didn't have back then. Let's see right. if we can get DNA off some evidence from the crime scene. And he mm -hmm. ended up solving it. So, And that case has always been one of my favorite, favorite to read about because mm -hmm. it was you know, my friends in my neighborhood scared me to death when I was a kid. But at any rate, there is some deep interest, but I think, you know, you still have the classes, but it's more of a thing for the masses as opposed right. to the classes uh, these days. As far as the sentiments, you know, with descendants and non-descendants alike, you've got some who believe every single word of it. You've got some who just remain silent right. and then you've got some who ride the fence and then some who will only laugh if you even mention it mm -hmm. i mean you've just got you you've got all the different groups as yeah. the same same as with any other legend and you've written about other legends aside from the bell witch yeah, I have I have looked into and investigated, researched a lot of different paranormal phenomena, legends, or more specifically, historical hauntings, mm -hmm. uh, besides the legend. And there is a book that I have on that, covers a few of those cases. It's called Ghostly Cries from Dixie, which mm -hmm. is a collection of strange and ghostly tales from around the American Southeast. And mm -hmm. I approach those stories the same as I do the Bell Witch, but I did not include as much research in the book. Uh, essentially yeah. what I'm doing, I take the story, I tell the story, then I analyze it based on research and, um, you know, just thinking it through and logic. 
and then share my own opinions as to whether I feel, you know, there's really something to it. And if so, what, you know, how this location might be conducive to a paranormal disturbance, or in some cases, how there's no way a possible, a paranormal disturbance could have ever happened. You know, it just depends mm-hmm. on the case. So that book, it covers not only ghost stories, but some just phenomena and weird stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we talk about the Brown Mountain Lights out of North Carolina. Very interesting case, a very, very interesting thing to watch. Interesting, all these people have offered up all these theories to debunk it, but yet every one of the theories is full of holes. I right. just want to laugh at it, just like the Bell Witch. But yeah. at any rate, <laughs> um, th- there is that. There is also the Devil's Tramping Ground, which is in mm-hmm. North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, that's a very interesting one, even though I, I I feel like I've gotten to the bottom of what that really was. Uh, the devil didn't land there and Lucifer didn't go around and do cartwheels and cheer everybody on or anything like that. It's called a grain silo being in the same spot for years and water and stuff, washing nutrients from the grain down into the soil and overloading the soil mm-hmm. with those nutrients and killing any chance of plant life. And the reason it's a circle is because it was a big grain silo. And the right. old timer, old timers verified that there was the silo that was there. And that right. when they took, they, when it was finally taken down, the ground would just look terrible because of all these grain minerals and everything right under it. So the book covers that. Another weird thing that's covered is the town of Jacksonboro, Georgia. My favorite story to tell from the book, but it's probably too long for us tonight. In short, a world-known, world-traveling evangelist named Lorenzo Dow from way back in the early 1800s, even before the Bell Witch times, was known as a hellfire and brimstone preacher. He traveled to Georgia to address the Georgia state legislature on something, and he was told by the townspeople of Atlanta about this little town out in the pines called Jacksonboro, where everybody was drinking and gambling and committing all kinds of crimes. So he decides to go down there and start preaching in the street of the little town and then conduct a revival to redeem these people of their wicked ways. And of course, they were all 100% against him doing that, except for one guy. More, More on him in a minute. But they had they formed a lynch mob and they were just about ready to take the preacher and hang him. And this one man said, well, if you all won't kill him, I will take him. He can come to my house. He will sleep over. And then at first light, he will leave Jacksonboro and you'll never see him again. Well, the angry mob of drunks said, okay, that's fine. Do that. We won't, we won't kill him. Then the next morning he leaves, he starts walking away and that drunk, angry mob is outside that man's house and they start to follow him like they're going to capture him again, the preacher. So he just stops in his tracks, turns around, quotes a Bible scripture to this angry mob of people. He took his shoes off, and then he spoke some words, placing a curse on everybody and every building in the town of Jacksonboro, other than a man named Goodall, who was the guy who allowed him to spend the night and saved him. So the preacher walked on out of Jacksonboro unharmed. In two years, they had fires, crop failures, all kinds of problems, and Jacksonboro as a town ceased to exist. A lot of the residents died in tornadoes and floods and everything, just the weirdest stuff in the world, and the remaining ones moved off to some other town. Today, there is nothing left of Jacksonboro. It's just nothing but woods and a couple of rocks that used to be part of the buildings, and people believe that the curse that Lorenzo Dow placed on that town is why the town was completely obliterated and gone within two years. Wow. Wow. But I there's love one, that story. But you know, there is one house in the old Jacksonboro area out in a field by the woods that survived completely unscathed and is still in perfect condition today. Guess whose house it was? That was Mr. Goodall's house. Hmm. Ghostly Cries from Dixie has that in it as well. And then there's (laughs) haunting stuff, Waverly Hills and my adventures up there and uh, St. Augustine Lighthouse, all kinds of other places. Yeah, Waverly Hills was fun. I bet. I haven't been there yet, but I'm hoping soon. 
Uh, well, if if you ever make it famous and make it rich off your radio show, if you send me the money, I'd like to go with you. <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I think no. I think I'm pretty sure I quit going up there probably 15 years ago when when the admission was raised up to like 250 bucks a person for half yeah, a night. Even looked into it for half yeah. a night. Yeah, and that's what it broke down to. They did it by group pricing for a lot more than that, up to so many people, then you divide it. Sure. Yeah. If I had a paranormal drama show, I could spend probably three hours talking about Waverly. But yeah. suffice it to say, some of the funnest times I ever had at Waverly were before the year 2004. Mm -hmm. I'm talking way, way back. Mm -hmm. A guy, a friend of mine, has been a friend of mine for a long time. You may know him. His name is Keith Age. Louisville Ghost Hunters, uh, works with Christopher St. Booth and the Booth Brothers some and all that. Oh, cool. He used to be the main chief head honcho ghost hunter there for years. I actually gave tours, did a lot of research and everything. And he introduced me to the owners uh, who became friends of mine, too. And okay. everything went well. You know, back in those days, it was fine. I would go up there to see Keith or he he would call me up or something. No, hey, let's go to Waverly. Let's go spend the night. Mm -hmm. And all he would do is call Charlie on the phone. Charlie was the owner, Charlie and Tina, husband and wife. He would mm -hmm. call them up and say, hey, I'm going to bring Pat up here. You got a problem if we camp out for a while tonight. And they never had a problem. We would go up there and have the whole place to ourselves. Oh, uh, wow. In, investigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I have good write-ups about that in the book, too, some of those investigations. Ooh. But then, uh, you know, and they were having haunted houses and charging some people to go there and investigate. And the money went to Waverly Hills Historical Society to mm -hmm. add a little bit of safety to the crumbling building, to right. make it preserve it for more ghost hunting. Then an announcement came out that they were going to take that money and turn it into a four-star hotel and oh. the same people. Yeah. And then after that is when their fees for anything from a tour all the way up to paranormal investigation group started skyrocketing. So that's when I quit going. That's when mm -hmm. Keith told him, told him bye-bye too. Yeah. Yeah. Some, someday maybe I'll end up making it down there, but it's one of those ones that you hear about and people have on their list of very haunted areas. But. Yeah, it was the only place where I've ever felt afraid in my life. Even though I wasn't really afraid, I think I was just startled. Uh, right. And I mean, I'm not, nothing scares me, period. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I guess I'm just too dull to get scared. But we were sitting, just the two of us, I think it was on the third floor in a wide open room that was either a cafeteria or a library like uh -huh. 60, 60 years earlier. Right. And we could see across the hallway, the main hallway down that wing of the hospital into other rooms across there because it was a full moon that night. And just where the moon was with the angle, it was shining right in there. You could see just about everything. Mm -hmm. so, so we decided we were going to take a break uh, so we shut off our cameras and everything and then had, had to go, have a breathing treatment. In other words, smoke a few cigarettes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not perfect. Um, <laughs> it's the last thing I am. But at any rate, we turned off our equipment, which was a no-no. It's an amateur mistake. You're never supposed to turn <laughs> off your equipment. And sat there smoking a couple of cigarettes. He was telling me all this other st new stuff about the history of the place he had found out. And, Meanwhile, out of the corner of my eye, I look over and down the hall, here's this nurse walking down the hall with what looked like very old, maybe 1930s style nursing coat and hat on. Wow. And he saw it at the same time. Thing was, this nurse did not have a bounce to her like she was actually walking. And we didn't hear the footsteps. She was standing straight up like she was walking, but I think mm -hmm. she was like floating in the air, just floating down the right. hall. We both yeah. saw, we mm -hmm. both saw that. And our equipment, cameras, everything were completely off. Mm -hmm. And, oh, you know, I, I think Keith was looking for me to either run out of there or pee my pants or something. <laughs> but instead I'm like, I, I like jumped up and I said, Hey, you stop right there. And I started running after her. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like I say, I'm not, I'm not scared. I, I, I'm, 
I'm not a mean provoker or anything, but if I see something, I'm not scared. I want to learn more about it. I'll go after it. See, so right. he's like, man, mm -hmm. don't waste your time. He said, I've seen her here before. She was oh. long gone. Of course, oh, I looked up man. down the hall and I didn't see anything. And I think about that, about that time, he threw a piece of paper in the corner over behind me and scared me to death. But uh, <laughs> that's the only yeah. time I've well, ever, that's the only time <laughs> I've ever seen what was, I would consider an apparition. Right. Uh, and I was more startled, I think, or surprised than scared. Because like I say, I felt drawn to go after the thing to take a closer look and maybe right. photograph some evidence rather than get scared and run away. Right. So yeah. that was Waverly. And there were some other really weird things that happened up there as well. And those are in Ghostly Cries from Dixie. And then I talk about, you know, some haunted houses in different places like uh, Woodlawn up there by Washington, D.C., uh, down in Vicksburg. Uh, Mississippi, you have the uh, McNutt House, uh, it used to be called McRaven. I think they're calling it the McNutt House now. Some stories out of my favorite city, uh, New Orleans, the old New Orleans and the voodoo and the hauntings from way back then, uh, my favorite topic. So uh, that's Ghostly Cries from Dixie. I'm excited. Like, I really want that book. Uh, it's going to have to be the next one that I get. <laughs> yeah um when you wrote that book was was this a situation where these were places that you had already been and then later decided to compile them or did you go to some of these places with the intent to add them to a book that you were already creating those are places that i had already gone to except mm -hmm. for one uh the one in texas the spook light story that uh happened over there close to longview texas Mm -hmm. uh, in Southeast Texas, I had studied up and read about that. And then at some point, I can't remember how long after I had studied up on it, I was in the area. I was actually visiting Arcadia, Louisiana, because I was trying to write about and visit the old Bonnie and Clyde ambush site. I was pretty close to uh, East Texas. So I made the trip over there to the area, um, the, the road, it used to be a railroad and now it's just a country road and there's a spook light that people mm. see and people have caught on video. Mm. Spook lights are very we interesting. We need to go yeah. find spook lights. I actually was wow. going to write a book about that. I've got a whole lot of books that I was going to write, but didn't. And I have a whole lot of books that have been in progress for 10 years that I really haven't had time to touch in 10 years, but I was going to write one called the will of the wisp and feature oh, all these yeah. spook light phenomena heather and i have talked about the will of the wisp a lot and one of the mm -hmm. things that we've definitely said is that it would be like i would follow it even though yeah. you're not supposed to necessarily yeah we're going we're gone <laughs> well yeah. yeah yeah that's some interesting stuff i mean i think most of what's seen is methane gas, and then I think some things might be reflections. But to me, the most interesting thing are all these legends, some of which are like 2,000 years old that have been passed through generations of Native Americans and old legends of where those people saw the same lights too. And right. that's interesting mm -hmm. in that if those are true or some old documentation, which I've heard that there exists some for some of these spook lights, it would disprove the theory that it could be the reflection of a car's headlights. Right, exactly. Mm, right. I've heard about I, that for the Brown Mountain lights, for one. Yeah, that too, yeah, Brown mm -hmm. Mountain lights. And way back then, I mean, a coal oil lantern or candle is not going to reflect or have the luminosity to reflect back and make a spook light type uh, right. apparition. Mm -hmm. Very true. I love the spook light stuff. And, and the fact that it's, they come in different, um, different shapes. I've read from like uh, Ruth Ann Music's books. There's been mm -hmm. stories of them that they're actual flames in shape. And some of them, of course, I think when people think of spook lights, they often think of like orbs of some sort that are bouncing around, but they come in different shapes, different colors. Um, yeah. I know. That's and, what I've always found interesting too. I mean, yeah. 
I don't like to assume, but just to assume that they were all methane gas. Why would, <laughs> right. why would methane gas be in completely different shapes and colors? Mm -hmm. Maybe there are yeah. different strains of it. Maybe it has to do with the mo with the uh, composition of the air. I don't know, but you know, just thinking out loud, if it's methane gas, it's going to look like methane gas. It's not going to ver have so much variation among right. the different sightings. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had you on here for a while, and we should probably let you go as much as I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> we, I have enjoyed this so much. And I want you to know that you have a home here at the caravan, and we can't wait to have you come back on. Oh, I'd love to. This has been the funnest interview I've done in a long time. Oh, um, yay. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you guys didn't even cut me off. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of times with, the, with these, I can't get started in an answer without getting cut off, or the interviewer mm -hmm. decides they want to argue with me or something like that. But this is, uh, this, this is a good one. Yeah, I, I, I've had a lot of fun. I mean, it's, you know, that's why I gave so many rambling answers and I didn't really stick to any answers, which I apologize mm -hmm. for, but it seemed more I like know. I was just sitting, we were sitting in a room or sitting around a campfire having yeah. fun talking <laughs> more so than an oh, interview. Perfect. Well, you know what? Oh, when she comes it. back to Ohio, I got to take her down to Tennessee. <laughs> we will find yeah. you <laughs> and we'll actually yeah. sit around a fire and talk for real. Oh, well, we could do the campfire thing. I mean, there's obviously the Bell Witch stuff, but there's other stuff, some of it around Adams, mm -hmm. but then all over Middle Tennessee. I mean, you've got the White Screamer. Um, I'll tell you about that sometime. Uh, Werewolf Springs, a lot of interesting places where, you know, people camp out, talk or, or you know, whatever. But I'm in. Yeah, yeah it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> A month that I'm there. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, before you go, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? For many years now, I've run the Bell Witch site at www.bellwitch.org. That has a lot of information about the Bell Witch uh, that I've researched. Also talks about my book, uh, The Bell Witch, The Full Account, and my other book, uh, Ghostly Cries from Dixie, uh, both of which you, you can order signed copies for through my website, or you can pick up at most uh, any retailer, including Amazon. Uh, as for my own personal author's website, general purpose website, it's www.petfitchu.com. And of course, I, I have the usual Facebook, Instagram, Twitter uh, thing going on too. Awesome. Well, thank Perfect. you again for taking time to talk with us and we look forward to having you back. Oh, Thank yeah, I'd, uh, I would love to do it. Uh, had a whole lot of fun and everything. If you ever visit the Red River at night, you better say a prayer. There's hates in the fields, screeching in the air. It began long ago when the Bell family met an unseen force. They called her old Kate, but she caused a stir with no remorse. Knocks on the walls and rats on the floor. Fear consumed the Bell home. Despite their fervent prayer, old Kate wouldn't leave them alone. Her annex were sinister. She drew skeptics from far and near, but no one could expose her. Even Andrew Jackson left in fear. Old John Bell, you'd better run. Get out while you can. You know she'll be coming soon to end what she began. It's clear you'll never walk away as darkness closes in. Now let Again. Oh, Kate, 
got meaner with time. People tried banishing her to no avail. Her plan was to kill John Bell. And in 1820, he breathed his last air. Some say old Kate left then, but many say she's still there. Comments.